so i think sir we will start uh, so very uh, good afternoon to all of you students and good afternoon anand sir and i welcome you on behalf of all my students uh, on behalf of our college ils law college and on my personal behalf and i would like to thank you for accepting our invitation to conduct a guest lecture on corporate governance so students first i will introduce you with uh, today's resource person mr anand shrivas he is currently working as an assistant professor of law at maharashtra national law university mumbai he possesses a decade of rigorous experience in prestigious organizations that are all significant part of the law fraternity uh, he has a niche in emerging and sought after field of law such as company law capital markets law and financial regulations corporate finance law corporate insolvency law and fintech law he has worked at prestigious national law universities in the country such as mnlu mumbai gnlu gandhi nagar and nlu assam he also has at a corporate boutique law firm by the name of acuity law and was also a part of the planning commission of india these experiences apart from the teaching experience have given him a much needed insight into the practicality of law and have helped him teach through a different perspective he possesses an llm degree from hidayatullah national law university raipur and llb degree from rtm nagpur university he is an editor in reputed journals also he is a guest faculty at national institute of securities market mumbai nimims school of law and other notable business school he also has received uh, a few scholarships from undergoing training courses from university of catolica milan university of paris nantere if i am pronouncing it rightly sir Uh, Japan Patent Office and Florence School of Banking and Finance European University Institute so now i would like to request you sir to start with your presentation on corporate corporate governance for our llm students thank you swati ma'am for your kind introduction uh, let me just share uh, the slides with you yeah okay so uh, as you know uh, today's discussion that we have or interaction that we have is on corporate governance history significance and the global scenario and uh, <clears throat> before i start uh, today's session let me uh, first tell you as to how i go about this session is that uh, this session would not be a monologue uh, it will be more of an interaction between you and me and uh, to understand as to what corporate governance is what is the history and the significance and the global scenario so here uh, our main focus uh, that would be there is to not to know as to what is the law i mean uh, we can always go and read a companies act and see as to exactly what the law is our main focus uh, in uh, in today's class is why is that law existing at first place and to understand the word why we would get into the depths of corporate governance and the corporate governance structures in different companies and uh, different frauds that have taken place in the in the past and to see as to what can what better can could have been done in these in these companies so my major focus uh, would be to understand why and how rather than understanding at this that is uh, exactly what it is uh, that is the main focus of uh, today's session so uh, now uh, let me give you a brief insight as to what corporate governance is and i'm sure that uh, as part of your course uh, you are already studying as to what corporate governance uh comprises of now there are many theories many definitions that have been written and uh, that have been uh, uh, sort of discussed 
but let me tell you as to there is no proper conclusion as to what corporate governance is even in today's times uh different uh, scholars have come up with their own definitions and there is a lot of ambiguity as to what exactly is corporate governance however if you read a book uh, by uh, my uh, willifer and tain uh, which is uh, which is a uh, uh, which is a professor uh, at a university of uh, oxford and if you see her book you would see as to the basis of corporate governance um, or if you read gower and davis you will understand the basis of corporate governance is nothing but to uh, to sort of eradicate misgovernance okay the purpose of corporate governance is to eradicate misgovernance that is the conclusion that can be drawn from the definitions that, that are there and and that is the sole purpose uh, for which corporate governance exists so um, as i said there are no uh, definitions that gives you uh, uh, ultimate clarity as to what exactly is corporate governance however um, as as rightly pointed out by uh, professor gower and davis in his book and uh, gulifer and pain one of the main advantage uh, of corporate governance is to eradicate misgovernance now uh, a general definition of uh, what corporate governance is is basically uh, a mechanism through which uh, problems that arise from separation of ownership and control within the company and that is what the corporate governance seeks to solve that is the one definition uh, that we are going to discuss in detail and we'll have a uh, lot of discussion on 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 uh, the first definition which is a general definition which is the most accepted de definition across the world however recently being very much criticized of being having a very narrow uh, narrow opinion number 2 is um, uh, is the definition which is given by the president of the world bank uh, wolfson and he says that corporate governance is about promoting fairness transparency and accountability um, now this definition is a very general definition which which does not give you as to exactly what corporate governance does uh, uh, in terms of the mechanisms but tells you the exact objective with which corporate governance should function uh, then comes so that dream cadbury's definition it says that i it is one of the most broadest definition that you would see and most relevant definition in today's time which is uh, written by sir adrian uh, cadbury uh, who was the chairman of the cadbury committee uh, who says that uh, corporate governance is nothing but a mechanism which holds the balance between communal and individual goals and social and economic goals and the last uh, which is a standard definition which is given by organization of economic cooperation and development which says that the it is a system by which the business corporations are controlled and directed now all of this um, if you look at uh, gives you um, uh, a general idea as to what corporate governance is our main focus is not to uh, mark uh, make you mark read uh, about the definition or to tell you as to know this is the exact definition that you should write in your examination that's not the purpose the purpose of today's session is to make you understand basically why corporate governance has uh, has taken so much of popularity why it has been written so much by these scholars uh, and why uh, too much of importance is given in today's time to corporate governance that would be the basis on which we will go and we'll discuss uh, today's session so let me start by something um, um which is a fraud which was taken place which is which is enron has anyone heard of enron has anyone heard of enron guys anyone would want to tell me as to have you ever heard of enron anyone no sir you haven't heard of enron okay yeah it so, was power company okay it was a power company what happened exactly can anyone tell me in enron so the main guy who was behind enron was kenley 
and Ken Lee was the managing director and CEO of Enron. As I rightly pointed out, it was a power company, and you can see through the uh, through the pictures as well here that uh, there is a power that is generated through a snake. Okay, and that snake is Enron, and the people that are being shocked are not are not the uh, are no, are the ones who are, which are the investors. Now, what had happened in Enron? Uh, was a uh, huge misgovernance that took place. Now, Kin Lee uh, which, uh, was the main guy who was controlling these, uh, the, this company and was a main man behind the entire fraud that took place. Now, what was the fraud about? So what Enron did that Enron had a huge uh, debt and uh, the Ken Lee, what he did was he started hiding this debt. So say for example, if you have 1000 crores or 2000 crores loan on your balance sheet and uh, you are a company and you're running a startup or you're running a business, obviously it doesn't look good to the investors. Investors would be very uh, wary of investing in your company because obviously with 1000 crores or 2000 crores loan on your balance sheet, nobody would, would be interested. So what uh, Ken Lee did was that he, he didn't uh, millions of uh, dollars uh, as debt uh, in the balance sheet of the company and fudged accounts by showing high revenues. So what exactly happened is that uh, obviously when these, the entire fraud came up uh, uh, before the public uh, that the accounts were fudged, obviously share prices went down and the, the, the people that suffered was not only Enron, I mean, Enron did suffer a huge loss, uh, but the people around Enron suffered uh, because um, let me let me give you a brief background as to the the one, the company which was behind Enron was Arthur Anderson. And if you know, if you heard of big four, what are big fours in accounting uh, industry? Have you heard of them? It's called big fours. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. What are they? EY, KPMG, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Yeah. And or, um, Deloitte. Okay. Now, all of these uh, big fours had a big five as well, and that was the big brother of all these uh, accounting firms. I mean, he was the largest accounting firm, which was Arthur Anderson. And uh, uh, during 1990s, uh, he was involved with Enron and WorldCom fraud, and he sort of helped or assisted uh, Enron to fudge accounts. Uh, it had around 80,000 employees, um, uh, the Anderson, Arthur Anderson, and Enron had around 20,000 employees. Okay. Now, Obviously, because of which customers, uh, consumers suffered because uh, they had to face shortage of supply of electricity. Uh, the uh, employees suffered because they were laid off because of these frauds coming up. And the most affected entity that was there was the liberal investors who invested looking at those fudged accounts. Okay, that was one uh, big example which happened in 1990s. Okay. Now, another fraud, uh, which is uh, which is which is which is called WorldCom, and uh, WorldCom was also uh, was 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 involved in uh, telecommunication business. Uh, it was also involved in um, what you say technology business, and WorldCom um, uh, main guy was Bernie Hebers, and Bernie Hebers was behind the entire. Uh, fraud that took place in in WorldCom. Now, WorldCom was not as uh, any different than what happened in Enron, because in WorldCom as well, Arthur Anderson was 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 the accountant, and and they also fudged accounts, shown the revenues uh, as the, the revenues which were not there, and they also shown some inline costs as as uh, which was not on papers. Okay. So this is uh, another case of cooking books, okay, or, or fudging books of accounts. Now, obviously, uh, this this entire situation uh, 
came before SEC uh, filed for charges against Bernie Evers and other um, uh, board members of WorldCom. All were convicted um, uh, for the offence. Now, the point that I'm making here is here also there were number of people that suffered. There were employees that were laid off uh, uh, both at the side of uh, uh, at the side of Arthur Anderson and also at the side of. Uh, uh, of uh, what you call Volcom. Now, uh, let's talk about another company and this company um, is Facebook. Uh, you can see the founder of the Facebook, uh, which is uh, here, if you can see, uh, is this guy uh, called Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, you all know about the, uh, the story of, uh, of Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg, um, this is the data which is 2015-2016 uh, data. So this might have changed, but uh, I'm just giving you a disclaimer. Uh, he was having 18% of the outstanding uh, share capital of the company, which uh, were into dual class shares. Have you heard of dual class shares? What are they? Or DVRs, which is called a differential voting rights. Anyone would want to respond as to what dual class shares are? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, DVRs are equity shares, but without voting rights. Okay. Anybody else who would want to um, would want to sort of uh, give an input? Uh, who said this? Uh, if I, I if, may, I have the name of the person. Who just said? Yes, sir. Sharon Pinker. Sharon. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, anyone, anyone else would want to sort of say as to what DBRs are or dual class shares are? Come on, guys. Anyone? I'm sure that you can do better uh, in terms of this question. DVRs are equity shares with differential voting rights. The voting power is uh, usually less as compared to the normal equity shares. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So see, um, that's not completely the case with DVRs or dual class shares. Dual class shares give you, um, yeah, there is some comment that has come out. Let me just check. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, anything different than normal can be said as differential voting rights. Like what is normal then? Normal is uh, one share, one vote. So okay. anything above that or below that can very be good. said as a different. Share. Okay, very good. Who said this? Uh, Ronak, sir. Ronak. Okay. So Ronak um, is uh, is actually hit the nail on its head. He's correct as to DVRs are um, anything which is either on the sides. But generally, what happens is uh, in a case of a DVR. Um, founders uh, generally want to keep DVRs with themselves. Now, um, what happens is founders, say for example, say IIT Ains, say IIT Bombay, okay, just adjacent to my place from here. Uh, IIT Bombay to um, graduates, um, say, starts a company and say, starts a company of uh, manufacturing uh, uh, recycled shoes okay something which is uh, 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 which is very unique as an idea you know uh, maybe uh, from recycled plastic bottles okay which has already been started by some other company but i'm just giving an example um, and such an idea which is such unique the technology has been brought up by these uh, say two graduates and they have started their own company now uh, they are looking for an investor and uh, they get an investor in say Sharun. Sharun wants to invest into the company, say uh, thousand crores or so. 
but Sharud says that C. Um, I would obviously would want to invest in your company, but I would take twenty six percent of the company for a thousand crores. Now, uh, just an example. Or say, let's keep it hundred crores. Hundred crores would be much better. Uh, keeping IIT Bombay and India in mind. So say hundred crores. Okay. So um, hundred crores, twenty six percent. Uh, both the founders uh, agree. Say, um, uh, I am the I am one of the founder, and someone else is the founder. Now, twenty six percent in a company. What does exactly it means? What 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 exactly it connotes? Anyone who can tell me as to what twenty six percent in a company mean, or what significance does it have? Anyone? So in the example that I've given, we are starting a company. I am a founder, and with me there is one more person. Say Swati Ma'am is along with me, and we have started a shoe company, which is a re, which is, which is uh, recycling the plastic bottles and making the shoes out of it, which is a very unique idea, and uh, is it's uh, it's uh, sort of. Uh, Directed towards sustainable uh, development goals, and this idea is very good. We are looking for an investor. We get an investor in Charun. Charun says that he is ready to invest in Red Cross, but he says that he'll take twenty six percent of the equity capital of the company. What does it connote? What is the significance that Charun has in the company? Sir, uh, the investor will uh, have control over. Uh, like special resolutions. Absolutely correct. Who said this? Uh, Ronak. Ronak. Ronak is again on point that at twenty six percent, Sharun would be able to block everything that requires special resolution. And if you have read companies act closely, there are important decisions of the company that can't be taken. Uh, unless a special resolution is passed, say for example, reduction of share capital, buyback of shares, or say for example, restructuring of the capital, mergers and acquisition, the related party transaction, so on and so forth. There are many under the Companies Act which would require special resolution, which in essence means that uh, Sharun would block all of this. So, as a founder, where I am. Because we started the company, and this guy, who's Sharun, who's uh, intelligent businessman, is coming to the company and in dictating terms, and we are we are sort of helpless within our organization. So, one of the ways in which we can restructure um, our capital is is say we were holding say twenty percent of the capital, and rest is with other people, and we would say that see. Uh, me and Swati Madam would say that see, twenty percent of my capital would amount to sixty percent of the voting rights. If you are okay with it, then uh, good enough. If you are not okay with it, uh, there is a uh, there is a problem. Obviously, a dispute. Now, this is one. Another is obviously in listed companies. You are public investors, so ten fifteen percent you can manage here and there. But the point that I'm making here. Is that if I make sure that my eighteen percent is sixty percent, which is in the case of Facebook here, if you can see, his eighteen percent is the fifty fifty seven percent of the voting rights, and he holds Class B shares. So when you draft a share purchase agreement, okay, or share subscription agreement, you divide things A, B, C, D, okay, and you say that Class A shares would have so much of voting rights. Class B shares have so much of voting rights. Class C shares would not have voting rights, but would have certain other benefits like that. You would divide your uh, your share capital, okay? When you're when when you're doing a share subscription agreement, or you're doing a, a, a investors agreement. Now, similarly here, if you see, Mark Zuckerberg has the has the majority, which means that he's a he's on a controlling side of the company. Now. 
he also has a class he has something called classified board okay so he has first of all one woman on the board called shirley he has uh, james breyer um, who is also a businessman and a good friend of him um, mark anderson who is again a uh, uh, good friend of zuckerberg peter thiel then there is a politician uh, uh, mr biblis and then there is an editor of a book called uh, donald uh, graham and then there is uh, reed hastings okay and he knows uh, the technology business uh, better than anybody else so these this this is the board of facebook which looks like and that this board is called as classified board now what does this classified board means is that they are appointed for a particular term uh, say for example 5 years 6 years and they cannot be removed unless there is a shareholder resolution to the extent of 75% they cannot be removed from the board so there is no annual recruitment of uh, or annual say of investors on the board's appointment which in essence means that in the example if this was our board in the company run by me and swati ma'am would would mean that see i am <clears throat> controlling the company i am controlling these uh, seven people and these seven people are there for five years and uh, maybe a reappointment is also confirmed later on this is called classified board now number 2 is something called ceo and chair okay now mark zuckerberg is also the chairman also the ceo of the company um uh, miss charlene uh, sandberg is um also uh, one on the board of the company she is also with um, what you call um, um uh, as one of the managers of the company and um, <clears throat> another person uh, that is uh, there within the company is also part of the uh, of the board now if you can see the here is that mark zuckerberg mark zuckerberg is controlling the entire company he is controlling the uh, stake here if you can see he is controlling the voting stake he is controlling the board and he is also controlling the management when I mean, he with in a sense means that um uh, means that uh this is very much um very much company facebook is as equivalent to mark zuckerberg so it's just that there is a name called facebook but the 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 company is mark zuckerberg because whatever he would say would happen in the company and this is one part now you can see here there are so many dislike uh portions here here as well here and all of these places now this structure is right now not liked by the regulators neither it's right uh, liked by um share shareholder activism groups nor it is liked by um uh, by by um what you call as um, proxy advisory firms have you heard of proxy advisory firms and what are they anyone what is a proxy advisory firm have you heard of them before anyone who would want to answer the question sorry Uh, have you heard of proxy advisory firms yeah they normally advise it's a corporate firm that uh, normally tend to advise shareholders i mean large i mean vote i mean shareholders or people who would like to invest in uh, large corporations as to what would their significance be in in the larger scheme of things so it's Very a good. kind Who's, of a portfolio management who who said that uh, ashwati ashwini okay so ashwini is um 90% correct as to what she said is that these proxy advisory firms help large investors to sort of decide on important matters or important decisions within the company by via thorough, thorough research that they do on those listed companies in india 
there is a proxy advisory firm called Ingovern, which is very famous in India. There are other proxy advisory firms as well. There are two, three, which you can count on fingers. And all of them look at corporate governance angles uh, within the company. And then they advise, uh, they, they advise uh, the um, <clears throat> the uh, shareholders such as institutional investors or uh, in investors which are high net worth individuals which are not uh, too much involved in uh, involved in the uh, day to day affairs so i'll give you an example as to what is the role of proxy advisory firms in today's time so if you must have heard of hdfc bank limited uh, uh, mr deepak parekh uh, was to be appointed as the chairman of hdfc bank and he uh, was by default appointed at most of the times as the chairman of the HDFC bank. But this time around, uh, which is uh, a few years ago uh, instance, when he was reappointed on the board uh, as the chairman, um, one of the proxy advisory firms advised institutional investors not to vote for Deepak Parekh because uh, he has uh, directorship in say 20 other companies and he would not be able to focus in HDFC bank and that was the advice that was given by proxy advisory firms. Um, fortunately for Deepak Parekh and HDFC bank, uh, the institutional investors that were voting were only 24% of the company and uh, um, because a special resolution would have ensured in any way appointment of the chairman. Uh, of uh, the HDFC bank, uh, it went through. But this was one single instance in India where proxy advisory firms have been uh, instrumental in terms of deciding and in terms of looking at um, uh, how companies operate and how interferences take place. Now, uh, <clears throat> why, why I discuss proxy advisory firms here is, is um, important because most of these large organizations, uh, uh, which are controlled by a few people, are not liked by proxy advisory firms. One of the reasons why is that, um, uh, as I said, Facebook is almost like Mark Zuckerberg. So uh, sometimes what happens is that people become despotic, uh, people become arbitrary in their, in their decision making, they are not democratic. But there is the other side of the story. And many investors in the Silicon Valley like Mark Zuckerberg. So we have regulators who are not liking it. We have investor groups which are not liking it. We have uh, proxy advisory firms which are not liking it. But at the same time, there is a class of people that are liking what, what Facebook is doing right now. Say, for example, uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the investors in, uh, investors in Silicon Valley and since uh, Mark Zuckerberg with this structure is able to give them value, um, uh, shareholder wealth, they are very much happy. So these are the two perspectives that emerge out of this uh, particular case study. Uh, now let me, uh, let me now go to another case study. Once we discuss these case studies, I'll come to the point. Okay. Now, um, this, this I'll come to uh, come back to this point before I uh, start. Now there is another um, problem. So you have companies which are controlled by Mark Zuckerberg. Okay. Um, managed by Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, everything by Mark Zuckerberg in Facebook. There are companies where there are investors, there is a board, and there is a manager or a CEO of the company. Okay. And there are clear cut demarcations between investors, boards, and the management. There is maybe negligible overlap between them. However, in case of Facebook, if you can see, the overlap is everywhere from here to here to here okay so which is in some cases not the case because what what you have is um, is ceos 
operating independently of the board okay and that is a case of tyco uh, have you heard of tyco uh, in us what was the problem in tyco um, and what happened with dennis kozolowski anyone who would want to uh, sort of give me an understanding as to what exactly happened anyone have you heard of this case have you heard of this case <clears throat> no sir okay so this dennis kozolowski um in some or the other way can be um um can be not replica you can say but maybe you can draw some similarities with vijay malya so dennis kozolowski is the ceo of the company uh, he came from a modest background but he led a extravagant lifestyle but that was not the problem the problem was that the entire extravagant lifestyle that he was carrying on was carrying on on the expenses of the company he organized his wife's birthday somewhere in lake como so is and yes so is it the same as johnson's control is is that this johnson no, no, no. no this is this is uh, tyco okay okay yeah, yeah. so um, so he uh, sort of uh, organized uh, his uh, wife's birthday at uh, at lake como and invited all celebrities and all of that and uh, and and then used company's money to give personal gifts to people uh, get them personal gifts in fact there is a story of uh, his wife um uh, going and flying to uh, somewhere in uh, somewhere in singapore and um, other asian countries and coming back with a a flight full of uh, goods you know uh, entire private plane filled with shoppings that she has done on the expenses of the company uh dennis kozolowski was also responsible because uh, he sort of uh, gave a lot of bonuses uh, to the employees and uh, uh, and especially people who sort of come to know that what he was involved or what he was doing and uh, and uh, the problem was that he started giving some sort of bribes to these people who started knowing what kozolowski was doing excessive compensation uh, that he was receiving because of his some linkages with the board and uh, and uh, he was getting excessive bonuses and all of this he was doing it on a company expense so this is one case study which is little bit different than facebook because facebook is all mark zuckerberg here dennis kozolowski is involved in scheme of things but he is involved at the ceo and the manager level now uh, before i get into um, apple um, i would like to give you a, uh, a snapshot of the three cases that i discussed and the tyco problem <clears throat> and there is a one more problem that i wanted to discuss which is adelphia i will just cover after this then i'll cover apple so uh, if you look at um, if you look at the cases that i discussed uh, we lo we looked at enron we looked at uh, uh, worldcom we looked at facebook we looked at uh, tyco okay enron worldcom people that were at the helm of affairs were the controlling shareholders of the company and they were also the ceo and the uh, md of the company so entire thing was controlled by them that means they were basically running the entire show in tyco and adelphia which i'll come to uh, adelphia a little later is when the ceo is involved uh, without too much of interference from the board 
or uh, from the investors. So there is a clear cut differentiation between where the board is, where the investors are, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now here comes the uh, problem. The problem is that when promoters control the company, okay, there is a chance of misuse or misgovernance. Okay, and that we saw in Enron and we saw in WorldCom. One side of the story. The other side of the story is <coughs> when promoter is not in control and there are managers who are acting independently, you see a case of Tyco or Adelphia. Okay. So you have a case where Promoters are everything. There is a problem. You have a case where promoters are just or investors are just investors. They have just invested and they are passive. And these people are running the company. They are, these people are running the show. There also there is a problem. <clears throat> so there is a theory um, in corporate governance which is called Shareholder primacy theory or agency theory. Have you heard of this theory? Have you heard of this theory? Shareholder primacy theory or uh, or agency theory. Okay, I'll ask a very basic question to you before I get into this theory. Uh, because I want to interact with you guys rather than to have a too much of monologue is um, if anyone can tell me as to who shareholders are very basic question who are shareholders so member, members of the company okay so are you saying that all shareholders are members so in case of company incorporated with shares, so then uh, we can say that shareholders are members. Okay. Is that true? How many of you agree with what he said? Sorry. How many of you agree with what he said? Who are shareholders? Very basic question. Shareholders are the people who hold shares. Shareholders are the people who hold shares. Hold shares in their name. Okay. Okay. Anybody else who would want to sort of uh, give an understanding as to um, who are shareholders? Are the owners of the company. <clears throat> they are owners of the company. Who said shareholders are the ones who hold the shares? Uh, Ronak, sir. Okay. Um, how are they holding the shares? Is there... Um, can you see a share? Uh, like you uh, hold it in uh, your name or virtually on the platforms provided? So... Uh, by <clears throat> so uh, is a share tangible property or intangible property uh, intangible property intangible property so then how yeah. they hold the but share? physical share certificate you can consider it as a tangible property yeah so you are saying that uh, physical shares are the evidence of the fact that they are shareholders yes right okay so now if these three opinions are taken into consideration, one saying uh, shareholders are the owners of the company, another saying that they are holders of the shares, and someone saying shareholders are the members. Now, shareholders are the members of the company. There is a different debate altogether. There are two situations in which shareholders are not the members of the company. Okay? Because uh, those situations are when someone is dead, a member is dead, um, 
at that situation and when there is a transfer of share at that situation they are not the uh, members of the company but only the shareholders so that's a different part the part that i want to discuss is are shareholders the owners of the company or they are just mere holders okay now if you ask a businessman they would always say that shareholders are the <clears throat> owners of the company if you ask a businessman how many businesses <clears throat> you have <clears throat> a businessman would say um i own this much of empire this much of businesses but if you ask a lawyer and ask him as to how much uh, your client uh, own in terms of businesses a lawyer is not going to say that he owns so much of businesses okay he would say exactly as to how much percentage he is holding in those companies okay he is holding 100% of this company 90% of that company all of that because technically speaking shareholders are not the owners of the company okay shareholders are just people that hold a share okay they are shareholders why i have come to this uh, debate is to understand shareholder primacy theory over agency theory now according to this theory and this theory uh, was very much prevalent uh, in uh, in early 90s and if you were to go in a time machine and go to the early 90s and see as to what shareholder um, primacy theory is is when if you ask the managing director or the chairman of the particular company as to what is the object that your company have he would say to increase shareholder wealth okay but if you sit down in a time machine and come to 1960s and 70s and if you ask uh, an mba chairman of uh, of a company as to what is the um, object of your company and they would say that uh, to have holistic development of the company along with the community and the uh, and the society okay if you step in a time machine and come to uh, 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 this millennium you will see both the opinions existing simultaneously shareholder primacy theory says uh, it comes from the uh, university of chicago uh, milton friedman uh, says uh, with respect to shareholder primacy theory shareholders are the owners of the company and the only and the only purpose of the company is business 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 okay and the only objective with which company is existing because company is existing for shareholders that is the theory with which the shareholder primacy theory exists which means that if company has to operate it only has to look after one business interest or two business interests which is of investors and the promoters so if company has to do that and company has to make profits um what people started doing in particular uh, start of the 19th century and even now uh, in the 19th uh, uh, around 1990s uh, close to millennium was that the company started doing cost cutting on everything they started cost cutting on uh, raw materials they started cost cutting on um, uh, wages they started cost cutting on safety standards they uh, started cost cutting on environmental standards and all of that and all of that leads to shareholder well now this is one problem that happens because what you are doing is you are continuously stepping up that accelerator and you are saying business 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 profit 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 and when you do that there is a huge problem that arises problems of laborers uh, problems of wages environmental problems safety issues and all of that and therefore shareholder primacy theory was a uh, one problem and 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 uh, this is also called as an agency theory because why is called agency is that board of directors of the company are agents of the shareholders 
which in essence means and if you look at agency as concept i always advise my law students at mnlu two law are of utmost importance you should mug up these two laws mug up mug up doesn't mean that you know just rat the rat fight what i mean by it, mugging up is to understand as to what agency is why agency exists what is the purpose agency law and trust law these are the two major laws that comes to your rescue when you start practicing wherever you start practicing agency law and trust law would be would be the two laws that would uh, be of utmost importance here if you look at agency law can anyone tell me in contract what is an agency law what was uh, what are the basic features of agency contract law if you remember anyone anyone who remembers little bit of contract on agency so basically we actually study that in agency laws there is a relationship between the principal and agent absolutely so we, yeah the principal will be more of a uh, you know a master servant not master servant but uh, somewhere he will be liable for the agent work which is being done okay what else okay so agency law basically talks about how much of authority someone can exercise as an agent and how much of authority he cannot exercise as an agent okay what is the authorization that the agent gets and what the authorization that the agent doesn't get okay and obviously whatever the agent will do principal will be responsible for the same but the problem arises because as whatever shareholder would say an agent would have to follow which in essence means a shareholder's word would be binding on the mind of the company which is the board of directors and that is the problem with agency theory and uh, or shareholder primacy theory and a solution to this problem uh, came up uh, later on with criticisms to this theory saying that boss let's separate these two let's separate shareholders let's separate the board and let's separate the management let all of them be at different spheres okay then there was another problem because when you separate shareholders you have separated you have separated the board you have separated the management okay in some or the other form the problem arises is now board is independent board is acting on its own management is acting on its own management is behaving irresponsibly who's to monitor management is someone who's maybe denis kozlowski or someone else who's 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 irresponsible who's using company's money and uh, 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 is sort of uh, promoting bribery within the company and all of that so the problem then came up which was an agency problem okay an agency problem here is that because there was an agency between shareholders and uh, the board and the management you separated them and when you separated them now they have started acting independently and when they started acting independently they have started using the company's resources uh in a manner which is not suitable in order to align this entire a uh, problem that arises of separation something called agency cost were uh, sort of uh, introduced an agency cost say for example is giving of esops uh, have you heard of esops what esops are yes sir uh, employee stock option program stock okay, option what scheme is what exactly is it Sir, uh, shares are given to the employees of the company, which are usually okay. lower than the market rate. Okay, who said this? Sharon. Sharon. Okay. Uh, who who else would want to um, uh, contribute to this? Uh, 
what ESOPs uh, are? Sometimes uh, an option uh, to buy particular shares are given to those employees. Who said Not those? just uh, uh, Ronak, sir. Okay, Ronak. Um, anybody else? Anyone else who would want to contribute? Okay. So, Sharon has given one point, which is very valid. Another point has been given by uh, Ronak. Now, what Sharon said that the company, uh, the shareholders get, uh, the employees get shares. They don't get a share. As rightly pointed out by Ronak, they get an option to buy a share or option to convert a share in future. So the main objective uh, of an ESOP, and I'm discussing it's important, among all the blah, blah, blah that the company would say, say, for example, we want to reward shareholder, we want to reward our employees, they are working so hard. We want to incentivize our employees. We want to encourage them. All of this is just the, what you say, sugar coating things. Eventually, what company wants is basically company wants to retain an employee. He would say that, see, today you join the company, I give you ESOP. Five years down the line, if you remain in my company, you can convert those ESOPs into shares. Okay. And these are large uh, ESOPs that I'm giving you, which in a sense means that the person would stay in the company if he at all want to exercise those ESOPs. ESOPs to stay within the company for five years. So that is retaining employees and that's the major purpose of ESOP. On the other side is uh, sweat equity shares. Have you heard of sweat equity shares? What are they? Uh, yes, sir. Whatever Sharon ex explained, can be said as sweat equity shares. Whatever I said now? No, no, no. Whatever Sharon explained uh, earlier. No, I, I, okay. I talked about uh, ESOP, but uh, yeah, it was uh, sweat, sweat, equity, sweat equity is uh, given at a discount. It is discount on face value, not market value. Sometimes okay. it is free of cost also. Okay. Yes. Uh, free of cost okay. as in, in consideration of uh, whatever services uh, you have provided to the company. Okay. That is good actually. Sweat equity shares are given for providing brands. So say for example, if someone is within the company and uh, is a big name and coming within the company and giving its brand. So in consideration, you would say that, you know, why not you have sweat equity shares of my company or say, for example, intellectual property for that matter. So you get the sweat equity shares for giving brand or intellectual property and certain kind of people are allowed and certain kind of people are not allowed to uh, uh, have the sweat equity according to the law. That's a different thing altogether. But the point that I'm making is sweat equity and ESOPs are the way through which you align the incentives. Because what you are saying is your shareholder, your board, your managers as managers, you get ESOPs, you get sweat equity shares. Now you have aligned the shareholders interest with and that is called agency cost. Okay, and uh, there are other regulatory costs that also arise with uh, with uh, with this entire problem. Now I'm coming back. I mean, I'm coming to the main point. This was entire a story, a story uh, in a story form. I explain you just to tell you as to what is the purpose of corporate governance. And if you now come back to my first slide and see. It says it solves the problem that results from separation of ownership from management. Okay. And exactly what I said is that corporate governance through different mechanisms, different, different regulatory models, it gives you an understanding as to how you balance these, uh, these, these agency costs. This is first theory. The second theory of corporate governance is called stakeholders theory. Okay. And um, can anyone tell me as to what is the difference between a shareholder and a stakeholder? Shall 
shareholder and a stakeholder what is the difference a shareholder uh, shareholder is uh, you know one of the stakeholders but stakeholders can be your employees the board the suppliers you know uh, the customers so that's a term that is largely used having Sorry. a broad spectrum of people involved um who said this ashwati ashwati okay so uh, ashwati you are correct um, stakeholders the word stakeholder means someone who holds interest in within the company okay stake means interest and there can be different kinds of interest obviously there are two kinds of uh, stakeholders which are called primary and secondary stakeholders primary stakeholders are the people that are directly involved with the company such as employees customers suppliers um, um, and government okay these are the directly involved people creditors sorry forgot creditors creditors as well all of these are the primary uh, people uh, which are associated other stakeholders are society a local community environment okay environmental groups all of that uh, investor groups all of these are secondary stakeholders within the company okay so the second theory is a stakeholders theory which is based on which is currently based on present corporate governance scenario and which says that the purpose of an organization is to have holistic development of all stakeholders and balance between their interest is a right statement in today's time uh if if uh, uh managing director or ceo is to ask uh, where to answer what does this mean is that you are not only looking at stake uh, interest of um, uh, interest of uh, of uh, shareholders you are also looking at interest of the environment you are also looking at the interest of creditors and etc etc now let me give you a classic example of this something called twilight period okay i and i tell my students uh, at at uh, nlu mumbai when a company is alive the main person that controls and runs the company are the shareholders i mean obviously the board is the main body which is operating the company but the shareholders are the ones who are controlling the company eventually but when a company is dead who controls the company anyone anyone who would want to say when a company is dead dead who controls the company dead means the company is insolvent sir so, uh, the liquidator the liquidator and who's controlling the liquidator or whose interest the liquidator is looking after uh, the creditors absolutely correct so if you look at the waterfall mechanism under the insolvency bankruptcy code and if you have not looked at please go and look at i think section 53 of the uh, insolvency bankruptcy code talks about the waterfall mechanism where it rates the creditors well above the other miscellaneous costs that might be there in insolvency say for example paying fees of the insolvency bankruptcy practitioner insolvency professional after that you have your secured creditors and all of that and then there is a ladder that is there and at the bottom comes equity shareholders now something called twilight period uh, is a interesting period when the company is neither dead Uh, neither dead or neither alive company is actually sick and company is so sick that the company is slipping into insolvency and that is the time uh, which is uh, called as twilight period is when shareholders start panicking because they know if they get into insolvency the promoter start panic if they get into insolvency they are right at the bottom of the ladder 
and that is a problem because if they are right at the bottom of the ladder then there is a problem right so what shareholders can try or would do in this situation anyone anyone who would want to state as to what shareholders would say say in this situation or do in this situation when the company is completely sick when i say completely sick is company into losses there is too much of debt within the company and it is going to die in some time you are the shareholders of the company just imagine your promoters what would you do in that situation when the company is is into doldrums and the control is in your hand because as i said the company is still alive even if it's sick and if the company is alive when shareholders do have control come on guys you can answer i am sure some of you can definitely answer the question sir voluntary winding up or voluntary cirp in that situation also obviously you would have the ladder so that is not going to help you because if the ladder has followed the first bite of the cake will be taken by the creditors and if the first bite is so huge as that is uh, amasses the entire cake then we are done shareholders are done, done and dusted so how do you make sure that the first bite is 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 sort of uh, not that much reduce the size of the cake that's the solution reduce the size of the cake make the cake in such a way that creditors get any willies so when the company goes into insolvency i would try to make sure that i do a buyback of shares the moment i do buyback of shares i'm selling all my shares uh, to the company company is giving me money or i what i do is i transfer some undertaking some factories some intellectual property let's sell them get the money convert that undertakings all of what or what whatever income you get into either dividends or some sort of payments into other various forms so what i have done is i have reduced the size of the cake now do you not think that this is unjust and unfair to the creditors because this is this was a crucial time do you guys think this is unjust and unfair to the creditors come on sir yes there is also criteria in, in ibc that uh, the the company cannot share their assets uh, before a certain period uh, when an application is ma made in the nclt for insolvency absolutely correct and in fact insolvency professional would investigate two years time so the insolvency professional is going to look back and see as to whether the transactions were genuine or not the transactions were genuine or not or they were manipulated transactions so this situation that i have told you is an unfair situation because shareholder is taking advantage of creditors okay not that the creditors never take advantage of the shareholders this is there is always a tussle between creditors and shareholders okay creditors also at many times take advantages but this is a very classic case where shareholder might take advantage and then as a board as a board you have to step up and if you are an independent director on the board or a non executive director on the board you would say that stop enough is enough you can't do this because this would lead to fraud towards the creditors and we are not allowing you to do this and that's the main purpose of stakeholders theory stakeholders theory says that boss you have to balance the interest of the shareholders vis-a-vis -vis the other stakeholders of the company say for example a merger scheme 
a merger scheme which is totally tilted towards the company and totally not tilted towards the employees employees aren't happy they are they are doing strikes they are opposing they are coming with different uh, movements and they are saying that stop this merger stop this merger but shareholders are hell bound they want to get the mergers done there comes the board and says that boss and especially the people that are independent within the company would say see their concerns are also valid let's look after their concerns and try to come to an amicable situation and amicable solution this is what stakeholders theory tells you third situation that i'm going to give you is say for example i am a pharmaceutical company say biocon and i am manufacturing drugs which are which are uh, which are essential uh, uh, to the life and uh, obviously these manufacturing of drugs cannot happen unless there is clinical trial of the same okay now these are indirect people on whom the clinical trials will be done they are part of your local community they are secondary stakeholders within your company you pay them but you don't tell them as to what exactly will happen to you after the say 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 this is a vaccine say for example and after the vaccine what will happen to you you don't know you are you are not telling them not transparent about them uh, you are not telling the consequences and and you have not so sort of uh, assured the safety of vaccine so there is a chance of someone dying or someone uh, losing his life so how do you balance these two interests there are obviously shareholders interest and there are uh, interest of the uh, people that are there within the company uh, which are uh, which are clinical trial groups uh, where on whom the testing will be done so you would say that as a board then you would step in and would say that see have we assured them that there will be there will be not too much of side effects have you assured them that there will be no death and uh, any any kind of situation and have we all have sort of ensured that uh, through our various tests that this kind of situations would not arise this is how you balance and if this balance is sort of not at if the balance is here then obviously other stakeholders will suffer and if the balance is here then obviously uh, the shareholders would suffer so you have to have a proper balance between these uh, these uh, stakeholders and that is what the stakeholders theory say is that the major and the major responsibility of the board is towards all, all stakeholders and the board acts as a trustee to the stakeholders now the point here is the word that has been used is a trustee to the stakeholders and not agent to the stakeholders or not an agent to the shareholders which means that the trust law becomes of utmost importance if something goes wrong and and then the law says that uh, the trust uh, there is a relationship of trustee and uh, beneficiary then obviously you are going to look at the trust law not going to look at agency law so therefore i say this to these two law you should be thorough thorough as lawyers having said that the these these are the two major theories that has come out and uh, are important the last theory which is uh, of little relevance of today's class is uh, stewardship theory where the board is a steward for uh, for the shareholders wherein he not only keeps the agenda of the uh, of uh, the uh, of the uh, of the shareholders but also he keeps the agenda of the society in general in hand and he is the steward for for the company so these are the three th three theories of corporate governance which is of utmost importance and through this entire story i have told you as to what corporate governance does okay what is the exact meaning of corporate governance what what is the exact purpose why corporate governance exists at first place now there are various methods and ways through which corporate governance can be explained so just give me one minute guys 
uh, I'll just take a one minute break and then we'll come back and uh, have the discussion on the rest of the uh, discussion which we'll have on corporate governance and we'll discuss. Okay. Yes, sir. You are able to see my screen, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so I am coming back uh, <clears throat> to the point of this uh, of of these theories that I talked about, which are very relevant. These are called theories of uh, corporate governance. Now, um, now another case that I want to discuss with you is the Apple uh, case. And uh, have you heard of the problem with respect to all Apple suppliers and labor practices? Uh, have you have you heard of these uh, uh, these case? Anyone? Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes, yeah. sir. So, Apple was involved. Um, Apple has a very good. Um, you know customer base it has a very good brand and um, <clears throat> they they are one of the best phone manufacturers in our uh, in, in 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 globe right now 
and they have amazing profit margins uh, but the problem with apple is that their suppliers and their labor practices are wrong they are not ethically right and uh, the main problem is uh, the hire um, some contractors which are working in um, indonesia and uh, these contractors then in turn hire child uh, laborers who are as small as 11 and 12 years old and 13 years old who go to the mines and uh, pull out tin uh, from uh, these mines and these tin are then used to make these apple phones so those who are holding apple phones right now uh, might be uh, having a tin which was mined by a 11 or 12 year old uh, boy now this um, has a lot of uh, connotation with the boards working because uh, boards uh, who are responsible towards the stakeholders uh, would have and, and there is a lot of exploitation in terms of what they are paid and all of that the working conditions are horrible all of that is there but the this is one problem that is there and that is at the board level another uh, case that i wanted to discuss is the adelphia case now, adelphia is also a good example of family run businesses and uh, riga's uh, family which is uh, uh, which was responsible for hiding millions of uh, billions of dollars in debt and making up numbers and uh, withdrawing money from the company because as you know, company is a separate personality and you cannot withdraw money unless you have authorization from the company. And uh, all of the executives uh, within the company, uh, which were the Riga's family, were charged with unauthorized, uh, 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 what do you say, um, embezzlement uh, uh, done on the company and uh, misgovernance of of the company so these are some cases that i have uh, that i have uh, found out this is a classic case uh, which is an indian case and uh, you all know this case which is can anyone tell me what case is this this is satyam computers and satyam scam and uh, you all know that satyam scam is a replica of what happened in enron wherein uh, they uh, sort of uh, created duplicate invoices and uh, sh uh, shown to the people uh, higher revenue and also uh, made sure that uh, the debt was hidden. Uh, they abused the related party transaction. There were insider trading transactions that took place uh, and uh, the uh, buying of properties of MITAS Amitas was also run by Ramalinga Raju, which was again an abusive related party transaction, which was done. Obviously, this uh, this was uh, done with the help of uh, uh, auditing firm PwC, and uh, case is still uh, going on with respect to the same. Uh, but this is one example that you see uh, uh, Indian example of corporate fraud. There are many other examples which we will see now. Once we have discussed what corporate governance is, I'll uh, discuss different models that, that exist uh, in terms of corporate governance globally. Okay. And uh, this is called market model. Uh, there is another model which is called control model. Okay. Now, what is the market model? Have you heard of this model before? Market model? These are uh, models of corporate governance at at different jurisdictions. So this um, uh, market model is uh, prevalent in um, USA. Uh, it is prevalent in uh, Australia. It is prevalent in uh, UK and Canada. Now, this model is basically surrounded by dispersed ownership. Okay. And when I say dispersed ownership, when I mean by that is there are different kinds of shareholders within a company. We all know uh, different kinds of shareholders. Have you heard of institutional investors, qualified institutional investors? What are they? 
anyone would say as to what qualified institutional investors are or qibs anyone come on guys so um if nobody is answering i'll, I'll uh, explain you qualified institutional buyers are sophisticated financial investors and they uh, they are like banks insurance funds pension funds okay uh, public financial institutions basically people who have expertise in uh, in reading of financial statements and investment okay there are high net worth individual investors which do not have as sophisticated knowledge as institutional investors but are uh, are regular investors into the market then there are retail investors which are investing below 2 lakh rupees uh, uh, people like you and me common man who's investing into these listed companies and there are different other shareholders like promoter shareholders uh, within the company which in essence means that in a market model and this is market model guys in a market model you have dispersed ownership it is characterized by dispersed ownership which means that institutional owners will have certain stake uh, uh, promoters will have some stake the uh, uh, what you say the retail investors and other people will have stake in the company which in essence means that these holding is staggered so obviously despotic behavior controlling behavior arbitrary behavior becomes very less unless obviously you have dual class shares which is a different problem altogether and that is what us right now is trying uh, is trying to solve then uh, they have bots which are more, much more uh, non executive uh, bots uh, there are uh, nominee directors on the company and the nominee directors as you know creditors nominate them on the boards of the company or particular shareholders such as minority shareholders nominate on the boards of the company so they are generally non executive directors which are there and they are not a part of their day to day decision making but they are part of decision making of a boards meeting then um, obviously um, all the directors that are there have their incentives aligned uh, they are marked with high disclosures and if you look at sec right now that is securities the exchange commission on these companies uh, mandates high amount of disclosures uh, all material information material interest uh, have to be disclosed uh, uh, periodically and also uh, which is also uh, called as uh, periodic uh, reporting and also occasional reporting wherever certain instances happen such as an ipo or an fpo etc etc this model is marked by shareholder equality uh, when i say shareholder equality which is which which is meant is that certain class of shareholders are treated as class and within that class there is equality and different classes are treated differently active takeover market now this is very important which is not there in india in india we have a very good mna market i mean there is no doubt about it but and uh, uh, and, and uh, but one problem that is there in india is we don't have a market where there are hostile takeovers prevalent which makes the market less competitive whereas in us market liquidity is so much uh, which means that the transfer of shares happens so much between individuals and there is so much of staggered uh, ownership because of which there is an active takeover market that exists and there are frequent hostile takeovers that take place which give a competitive edge so any company which is run on the basis of misgovernance and is uh, is not operating properly is actually <coughs> is actually looked at in a much more uh, uh, much more a way as a way as if it is a prey for a shark okay because if companies uh, is a loss making company it's not operating properly properly the people like uh, big investors 
they would uh, they would buy these companies out uh, hostilely and then they will uh, convert these companies into profit making companies equity equity markets and equity debt market uh, both are there in these uh, in these uh, in this market and obviously involvement of sophisticated institutional investors and increased transparency and accountability so this is a market model and this is based on the mckinsey report so mckinsey report came in after enron uh, worldcom um, uh, tyco adelphia these kinds of frauds went to place in us mckinsey report came in and the mckinsey report decided that there are two kinds of uh, models that are being formed then there is a model which is called as control model and that is followed in india uh, uh, euro some part of the european countries um, it is uh, uh, in some asian countries and um, and uh, if i am not wrong it is followed in japan so these are some countries where control model is followed now what is control model control model is characterized by concentrated ownership and we all know indian our uh, businesses are family owned businesses or friends and family are running the businesses so if you watch uh, you guys must be watching shark tank okay if you watch shark tank india and shark tank us you will see a a huge amount of difference and the difference uh, is that the people that comes to shark tank us are mostly unrelated but when 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 you see uh, a shark tank india they are somehow somewhere related to each other and that is the problem so concentrated ownership is a problem in india because a promoter owned businesses are there and they run the show like what is the there in the facebook which also means that the boards are insider boards and uh, their independence and performance is questioned because uh, the boards are appointed by the promoter owned businesses whatever is nominated by the board is actually appointed by the shareholders because if you go to the shareholders meetings which we call as annual general meeting or extraordinary general meeting large amount of shareholders do not participate in these businesses uh, are you guys able to hear me because my network is uh, unstable right now can you hear yes, me so you are you are audible sir okay. okay good good so so the point that i'm making is in uh, in india uh, this is a problem obviously limited disclosures are there and uh, companies uh, uh, do not have uh, a huge amount of disclosure requirements then is um, inadequate uh, minority protection obviously minorities are not adequately protected uh, in india and we have seen number of cases that have taken place uh, in india uh whether it's um, uh standard chartered banks case or you talk about kalinga tubes so you talk about uh, needle industries minority uh, have always been uh, uh, protection has always been an issue because majority is running the show and he uh, least bothered about uh, the minority shareholders take over market in india can anyone tell me how many hostile takeovers have happened in india hostile takeovers acha any recent hostile takeover any recent hostile takeover i am sure that you must be aware of this hostile takeover okay so indian cements acquired rasi cements way back i think 1990s at that time um there was um um uh, acquisition been by the dalmia group on the oberai oberai uh, hotels group but that was not successful then you have um, recent example is lnt and mindry uh, where in lnt acquired mindry uh, hostilely so that is these are three four examples that you can see um, because uh, hostile takeovers are not so prevalent in india because one concentrated ownership and uh, um, and the not supportive regulatory structure under developed new issue market now you see so many people coming companies coming with zomato coming with an ipo burger king coming with an ipo um, you know different companies coming with an ipo 
now the market is developing but earlier we we actually come as companies were only relied on finance from banks and financial uh, state financial institution so now you see that there is huge reliance that is being developed on 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 uh, ipo and fpo and other forms of uh, finance raising so these are the two models that are there which are corporate governance models that exist at different countries uh now there are different principles on which uh corporate governance is based um and these principles are um, are uh, around 6 or 7 principles and one of them uh, is uh, ensuring uh, effective corporate governance framework and uh, we'll come to um, uh, the the framework that we'll have is that obviously you have um a board which is more independent okay board which uh, which is uh, the composition is diverse the board that looks after not only um, minority shareholders but also foreign shareholders in india there is a history i mean there is a history that foreign shareholders and minority shareholders are exploited in indian companies so uh, so uh, ensuring effective corporate governance framework via having audit committee in place why are having nomination remuneration committee in place why are having stakeholders committee in place why are having csr committee in place why are having robust class action suits mechanism in place why are having duties of directors in place all of these are basic things that are required to have a effective corporate governance framework apart from this obviously uh regulating auditors and other things that also forms the part of the basic corporate governance principles so given a chance uh maybe in future i would want to sort of discuss the companies act uh, framework uh with you guys wherein i discuss all these mechanisms which exist under the companies act including the whistle blower mechanism that is there and all of these are effective corporate governance framework that exist uh, currently in india second uh, objective uh, with which uh, oecd addresses uh, corporate governance uh, our principle is to ensure protection of rights of shareholders <coughs> so as i said different classes of shareholders have been treated differently in india and uh, uh, that's one uh, uh, sorry um, Uh, minority shareholders have been treated differently than the majority shareholders in india and the foreign shareholders uh, have been treated differently so giving them equal protection giving them uh, specific rights giving them participation rights uh, within the company uh, is something that is uh, important holding meetings between the shareholders regular meetings between the shareholders uh, solving their grievances is something that is more important um the second uh, the third principle emanates from the first one which is equitable treatment of the shareholders uh which is again uh, treating the uh, uh, uh shareholders with fairness and all of that then uh, role of stakeholders in corporate governance is important so employees uh, uh consumers um, um and uh, what you say suppliers and all of that when they see that there is some misgovernance uh an ability to say no is is uh, very much important because when they are able to see that something is going wrong within the company not to participate in such kind of uh, such kind of situation so say for example uh, in apple uh, case study um, you have phones that are coming from uh, which are mined from uh, child labor or you see uh, so certain other unethical issues with certain other companies as consumers you have uh, your own responsibilities to say no um disclosure and transparency again uh, is uh, important now disclosures can be periodic and uh, they can be uh, situation based disclosures and now the problem here with disclosures is that disclosures should not be made for the sake of it okay if the disclosures are made they should be properly circulated among all the stakeholders and these disclosures are in 
in a form which tells you material irregularities in the company or material problems in the company say for example hiding a thousand crores debt on the balance sheet of the company would not be a right disclosure or hiding deposits within the company would not be a right disclosure or abusive related party transactions on the company would not be a right disclosure and the last one is that the uh, the board also have huge amount of responsibilities uh, towards the company and the responsibilities are again under the companies act under the indian companies act today are very much listed uh, you have section 166 of the uh, of the companies act which gives you the entire list of duties that the board has to follow and those duties are uh, are uh, very comprehensive in fact independent directors have their own uh, own uh, separate duties uh, when it comes to uh, independent directors so these mechanisms um, say for example composition of the board having diversity within the board say uh, say women directors on the board uh, independent women director and that is more important because what has happened in the past is uh, that when uh it was said that women director should be on the board so people appointed their own wives and their own uh, their own mothers uh into the board and they had uh, absolute no knowledge of what was happening in the company so they were just mere puppets so now the sebi regulation says that there has to be a independent woman which should be on the board with certain expertise so uh, at the composition level at the responsibilities level uh there are certain uh, guidelines which have been carved out under the companies act and uh, they are section 166 and section 149 of the companies act whenever you get time you can go through the same now <coughs> different board models are there <coughs> in the uh, us uh, india uh, japan and <coughs> germany so germany you have a very unique model wherein you have a dual board structure and one board is appointed by the employees and the other board is appointed by the shareholders and uh, employees play a huge amount of role in appointment of directors on the company and therefore when the employees are given uh, a say obviously the board's decisions are much more holistic towards the decisions of the towards the uh, uh, say of the employees japan follows a very different model again they follow a model wherein 50% of the board would come from the shareholders shareholders would appoint the uh, board and 50% of the board would come from uh, uh, would come from uh, creditors so japan is very different uh because japan is saying that boss creditors interest is of utmost importance and half of the board should be appointed by the creditors so banks financial institutions are sitting on the uh, on the on the board and the most unfortunate problem with both the prop models are that the board then only looks after shareholders creditors interest or the board only looks after um um uh, shareholders employees interest so there has to be a holistic board that is uh, that is working so in us you have uh, two level boards you have a supervisory board which is managing the main board okay and uh, obviously the appointment is again done by shareholders but there are nominee boards uh, nominee directors on the and independent directors on the boards of the us uh, companies which is much more uh, aligned with what we follow in india we have in india you know that uh, right now if the chairman of the company is the ceo of the company then half of the board should be independent director and if the chairman of the company is not the ceo of uh, of the company and he is a non executive director then one third of the board should be independent directors uh this is laid down in um, in uh what we call sebi lodr regulations and uh, it is important that you go through uh, these two regulations one is sebi lodr and this companies act now in us you have sarbanes oxley act that governs or provides for corporate governance mechanisms 
in India, you have Companies Act plus what we call as LODR, SEBI LODR regulations. Can anyone uh, tell me as to what LODR stands for? LODR. Have you heard of LODR before? Guys, Sir, listing obligation and disclosure regulation. Disclosure requirements. Correct. Yes, requirements, yes. disclosure requirements. That's correct. LODR, uh, which were amended in 2015 and 2018, is the major law on corporate governance in India, which talks about formation of audit committee, um, uh, how the related party transactions would work, um, how is the composition of the board of directors going to take place. All of that is uh, LODR and, uh, um, and there are other disclosure requirements which are there under the LODR regulations apart from the Companies Act. Uh, apart from LODR, there are other uh, uh, miscellaneous regulations of SEBI that also becomes applicable, but obviously we don't have time to discuss uh, the LODR or Companies Act in detail. I would have had a, um, I would have, uh, you know, sort of been happy uh, if uh, I was able to discuss the Indian law, but that's not possible right now. Um, let me just see and uh, if, if I'm missing out on something, I'll just uh, close it. So this is the development which is, uh, which is happening uh, uh, in US. Uh, you have scandals that are taking place, then the McKinsey report, then the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, which is a uh, uh, corollary law on what we call as as a law on corporate governance. And then in UK, you have Bering's Bank scandal and a BCCI scandal. There was a BCCI scandal also in UK, not the Indian BCCI. There was a financial institution in UK, which is called as BCCI. Then came Cadbury Committee, then came Handbill Committee report, then Greenbury. And all these three, along with uh, Ruthman Committee, all these four committees were called as combined code of corporate governance in UK and it is still in existence and it has mandatory recommendations. Now earlier these were non-mandatory recommendations, but since they have become combined code, now they are part of mandatory recommendations to the company. In India, then you have 90 scams like Harshad Mehta, Ketan Parekh and a lot of IPO and vanishing company scams that took place in 90s. And then you had Satyam and Sahara, and uh, obviously, uh, then you have these uh, committees like Narish Chandra, Naren Muthi, Birla Committee, and the recent ones are JJ Rani Committee Report and the Court of Committee Report. So all of these is the history and development of corporate governance in India. Um, all of these led to what uh, is today's uh, Companies Act, along with the amendment, because Court of Committee Report has suggested certain uh, amendment which are uh, recommended are non-mandatory but some of them definitely will be taken into consideration so um, <clears throat> these three com these committee reports are the basis of what companies act today exist um, these theories we have discussed already and um, these are the major problem that uh, the corporate governance Solves and we have already discussed the role of board and the management, composition of the board, role of a CEO and chairman. That is, this is very important. Now, most of the Indian companies, the chairperson and CEO are uh, sometimes are the same. In spite of SEBI uh, coming out in the LODR regulation saying that boss, you cannot be a CEO and chairperson together within a company and you have to separate this role. Some of the company are still non-compliant. And uh, that is one problem. Another problem with committees uh, is that some of the committees are still headed by uh, executive directors and they have vested interest. Some of the committees are headed by the independent directors, such as nomination, regulation committee and the audit committee. Uh, there are a large number of disclosure requirements uh, that are there under the Companies Act and the LODR regulations, uh, protection to the shareholder rights and institutional investor participation. Now, I would say this is of utmost importance because if you look at the debate on shareholder activism in today's time, role of institutional investors have become of utmost importance because they are the ones who are going to put their, uh, put their foot down and say that boss, this is not right and this is right. Okay. So 
these days uh, many institutional investors and investor groups are working towards activism in india and uh, and 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 some of the examples are hdfc and godrej are some of the few example and rare examples in india but uh, obviously in order to go forward we need institutional investors participation uh, in future the last is the benefits and these are the benefits of uh, of corporate governance uh, competitive advantage effective performance by eliminating fraud ensuring compliance and enhancing value with this i end uh, today's session if you have any questions i have 5 minutes to answer them uh, i'll be happy to answer these questions any questions students you may raise your hands if you have any question any questions you have i know two hours will be very taxing and tiring i can understand that and i come from the same field so i am also facing the same problems so uh, but if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer if you have no more questions i'll um, um i'll uh, sort of uh, close today's session uh, you guys can contact me on my email address and take from uh, swati madam in case you have questions in future okay thank you thank you very much uh, anand sir uh, the different perspective with which you have uh, discussed the concept of corporate uh, governance and number of examples that you have shared and discussed with the students i'm sure that students must have understood the significance of corporate governance so i thank you very much for accepting our invitation and conducting this yes. lecture for students and uh, with this uh, we will end the session students thank you very much sir thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you sir Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Take care. Bye, bye. Bye, sir. Students, we will meet uh, for our regular lecture tomorrow at one thirty. As I believe you have a guest lecture for legal theory tomorrow at ten thirty. So. we will have our lecture at 130 clear yeah? okay ma'am okay ma'am okay.